the gig outside Parliament was funny. I was there for the Occupy demonstration, and after a while of the usual marching around and chanting stuff, we assembled at Parliament's gates and I was asked to sing some songs. I don't know any of those old lefty folk numbers that are usually the law at such assemblies, so I did Coalition and another Know Your Enemy. Thankfully, people joined in. We were blocking the entire road by now, with double-decker buses whizzing past us, and as I looked around while singing They're All Criminals Now, on that simple, sunny afternoon, I had a little internal chuckle to myself at just how surreal it all was. I was playing to an audience of banner-waving protesters, bewildered but snap-happy tourists, pissed-off Londoners trying to squeeze past, an array of news cameras and a line of police. And right behind me were the gates to Parliament. I had a nice chat with one of the coppers afterwards about guitars and more details were swapped. It was all good fun. After getting home to one arsey exchange too many with my teaching agency, about trousers, would you believe, I handed in my notice. It went like this. Hi James, yes, it's just that, um, well, it's not acceptable to be wearing jeans at school. You're a teacher, not a... I wasn't wearing jeans. Yes, yes, I hear what you're saying, but it's just not good enough. You can't be wearing jeans at school. You're a teacher, not a... I wasn't wearing jeans. I was wearing trousers. I've been teaching for 15 years and not once have I ever... James, look, it's just not good enough to be wearing jeans at school. You're a teacher, not a... Click. Fuck it. I wasn't listening to that babble anymore. Jeans? What was that mental bell end blabbering on about? It was one petty stupidity too many, and I just couldn't deal with humoring the guy any longer. I handed him my notice, he never replied, and then three months later gave me a bollocking about having missed a term of school and asking if I'd sorted my trousers yet. Absolutely batshit crazy. I was jobless again, with no plan for money, but I just didn't care. At long last, Circle was due for release in a few weeks, and I was keen to see the reviews conscious of the fact that this album was a big stylistic departure for us. To my surprise, many critics still referred to the music as complex and progressive when it was intended to be our mainstream album. The three-piece take pride in being hard to define, combining complex compositions with a taste for the epic, not to mention freewheeling riff action. With an explosive live show that has laid waste to both sides of the Atlantic, the band's intentions are clear to fuck things up and break down the walls of genre. And long may they continue to do so. Big Cheese Magazine. I'm not totally sure as yet whether it's a work of absolute genius or actually a bunch of weird, discombobulated nonsense. But oddly, that's exactly what makes Kaishira so intriguing. Rocktopia Magazine. Not every band can capture such energy and ideas in their music and wrap it all up into bite-sized pieces. But Kaishira appeared to have pulled off a masterstroke with Circle. 8 out of 10. Powerplay magazine. We were stoked that the album had been well received, but also pissed off that once again, these were all reviews we'd got by ourselves. Our PR guy, our paid PR guy, hadn't done much over the past few months, but you're probably bored of hearing me say that. In his defense, his life was a mess, and I didn't realize just how much of a mess his life had become since Daghorn had fucked him over. He seemed like a good guy deep down, and at our London show, he approached me afterwards and apologized sincerely for letting us down. He refused payment and said that he was embarrassed, ashamed, and had a long way to go to get his life back on track. How can you stay pissed off at a guy who's in that hole? Despite its spewy inception, my venture into music publishing had some good beginner's luck, and I'd managed to bag a few TV placements for some mates bands, including one for Cat in Taiwan and one for Alid in the US. My roster was growing steadily, and by spring, I'd managed to land a big US TV ad for an amazing unsigned artist from Brighton named Bunty. It was fortunate timing for me, as I was now jobless and needed this to work. But it also felt great to be able to send opportunities my mate's way. Perhaps all those rejections were a blessing after all. Our headline UK tour was booked for April, but I was a little skeptical as to some of the choices of venue. Apparently, to get the booker on board, our now ex-manager had told him that we could fill 500 capacity rooms up and down the country any day of the week, no problem. We couldn't. To make things worse, another of his roster bands from the States, an amazing band called Gooding, 
was mad keen to get some UK shows, so he plonked them onto our tour as the opening act. Now at our level, the standard practice is to have local support bands in each town to draw some extra local ticket sales. You certainly don't have a band from thousands of miles away who can't shift any tickets, especially when it's going to cost said band a ton of money to get over here, hire equipment, transport and accommodation, only to play to hardly anyone. I was worried for them. There was no way we'd fill these rooms. We'd had zero promo and all the big talk from everyone at the start had been more empty bullshit. And yet it was us who would have to go out there, play to half empty rooms and look these poor American guys in the eye every night knowing that they've probably remortgaged a house to come on the road with us. It'll all be fine, the agent said. Well, you can call me a cynical, miserable bastard all you like, but I began to suspect that this tour was going to be a fucking disaster. Our opening night at the Globe was a layup. Home turf, easy crowd, great gig. The support bands were buzzing. This tour was going to fucking rock. But as the week dragged on, and we were playing giant rooms in Wolverhampton on a Tuesday night to practically nobody, the mood started to sour. You could feel the distance and discontentment growing between the other bands and us. They blamed us for this shit. Don't get me wrong, I have no problem playing to small crowds. It's what I've done my entire life. But we just felt fucking terrible for that poor American band. And they knew. We knew. Everyone knew. This was a joke tour thrown together so that a booker could get three bands off their to-do list. But it was our name on the poster. Soon the US band were just playing for themselves. And instead of sticking to their half an hour set time, they'd jam on for over an hour. Meaning that we, the headline act, had to cut our set down to 20 minutes some nights. Words were had and ignored and resentment just continued to build on all sides. It was cringeworthy. In Nottingham, this singer and I got it all out on the table. I explained to him that I had begged our agent not to put them on the tour. And he told me they'd paid over 17 grand to come out and do these shows on the promise of packed rooms every night. I couldn't fucking believe it. Nobody had been able to get hold of the agent for weeks. Until he called to tell us he'd added another band on the bill. A good local crowd puller up north. They were neither good nor a crowd puller. Genuinely believing they were Oasis, these posturing, swaggering, sunglasses-wearing, fisherman-hat-wearing, raincoat done all the way up, bunch of absolute fucking morons descended on our already shambolic travelling travesty like a proud steaming turd on a six-year-old's birthday cake. None of us were in the mood for their arrival. Turning up late, drinking everyone's rider, having to borrow everyone's gear because they had fuck all of their own and then breaking it, playing way over time, falling over pissed on stage in front of four people and absolutely fucking sucking every night. If the tour wasn't a joke already, it was comedic genius now. I was counting the seconds until it was over and spent as much time as possible in an alcoholic stupor. The only good thing to come from that tour was that Glyn met his future fiancée, at the now-closed square in Harlow. It was also our first true subjection to Glenn's nightly exorcisms, otherwise known as snoring. I have never before, nor ever since, heard anything quite like it. One night, squeezed three in a row in the back of our airless van, which was mostly full of gear, merch, and God knows what else, I recorded it, and it honestly sounds like Satan is screaming all manner of filth at you, through a scrambled alphabet of twisted, gargled seizures. It is a medley of jagged howls, staccato grunting and blood-curdling sleep talk from some bizarre, otherworldly dimension below. Matt and I would lie there staring wide-eyed into the darkness, denied sleep for days on end, desperately yearning, praying, pleading for just one night of fucking silence, which never came. Obviously, the next morning the well-rested drummer is bouncing off the walls and loving life while Matt and I are barely able to pull our faces off the dashboard. Thank God there were all the other trappings of road life to make up for it, such as the aforementioned Evian shower, where you strip down to your pants in a car park and throw cold, bottled water over yourself in a pitiable attempt to rid yourself of all things smelly and sticky. And how about drying off? Well, nothing is ever really dry on tour. 
You can give towels and t-shirts a little blast on the van roof or hang them up in the back, but they're never really what you would call dry. After a stint on the road, all your clothes become a homogenous mass of moist, creased, smelly papier-mâché. Except socks. You can spread a whole row of those bad boys along the dashboard vents and have toasty warm foot cuddles by the time you get to Hull. And hey, the food is spectacular. If you really, really love expensive processed ham and cheese sandwiches from petrol stations, then touring might just be for you. And the money too. Oh wait. What does keep you going on tour is one, band camaraderie, two, the show, and three, the fans. No matter how frazzled, hungry, and pissed off you are by the time you finally arrived at the venue, no matter how much you get dicked around by the promoter and the other bands, no matter how much you wish you were at home, and no matter how shit it can get, you have an extended family excited to see you in every town. People who have also traveled for hours, queued up, spent their hard earned money, arranged babysitters, and been excited all day to see you play and hear your songs. In fact, I don't like the word fans because I've formed real, lasting friendships with many of our fans, and we've always felt a deeper mutual connection and respect that far outweighs any simple notion of a fan. From the very start, we've been given sofas to sleep on, a helping hand, incredible moral and financial support, parties, good times, and memories in every single place we've been, either at home or abroad. The industry will relentlessly drain your morale and faith in humanity. The antidote to that is spending time with your fans. Knowing that songs you wrote in a dark little room while penniless have been played at people's first dances and funerals, seeing people singing your words through tears, seeing your lyrics tattooed on people's hearts, seeing the same faces of venues all over the country, and seeing just how happy you can make someone by spending just a little time with them, all of that, there is absolutely nothing like it in the world. And it makes all the pain, failure, doubt and struggle disappear in a flash. The relationship between band and fan is an equal two-way relationship and I hope that all our incredible fans know just how much they kept us going. That said, I was glad this tour was over. We amicably parted ways with our agent and never spoke to him again. Yet, despite grating at our soul, it seemed the tour, along with the reviews, radio play, videos and general activity at Camp Kashira, was at least given the perception that we were doing stuff because we were quickly approached by another manager, this time based in London. James Black had been on the scene for years and was well known on the rock and metal band circuit. Sound familiar? We had a meeting with him and he talked a lot of sense. He said our tour was organised to fail. It was a shambles. It never should have happened. He listed all the things that he would have guaranteed were in place before we even agreed to do it. He asked us about our endorsements. They were scant. About our PR campaign. Don't worry, I know someone who can fix that for you. About our plans to tour abroad. None? Leave it with me. It was music to my ears. But don't forget, my ears are screwed. We didn't sign anything with him. It was only a meeting. But then two days later, he called up. Do you want to tour Europe with cult 90s metal band Snot? Uh, yes. Great. It's in two months. Leave it with me. What? Okay, so as well as saying the right things, this guy was doing stuff. That's different. My instant reaction, as with all things, was not to call my missus or my mum, but Matt. Needless to say, he was beyond up for it, as was Glyn. I checked their upcoming dates online and they were playing in Italy, France, Spain, Portugal, Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland and a few dates in the UK too. We had to do it. It would be the peak of summer, we'd be doing proper shows with a proper touring band, none of that small time bullshit we'd been doing over here. Mentally, we'd already made our minds up without knowing anything about the deal. The deal, as it predictably transpired, was a buy-on. For those that don't know, a buy-on is where a smaller band pays a bigger band to give them a support slot. It's rife throughout the industry and don't be fooled, your mate's band is doing it too. The smaller band gets to jump on an awesome tour and play to the bigger band's audience and the bigger band gets its drugs paid for. Win-win. Not entirely. 
It's an unfair, corrosive exploitation of the fact that for most bands, practically every other door is firmly closed to them, making them desperate and easy prey for a quick buck. But this wasn't the ideal world of fairies and unicorns, and we tried every other door going over the past five, or was it ten years? And yep, they were all very firmly closed with a big go fuck yourself sign on the front. So I wasn't writing off the option of a buy-on if we could afford it. As it turns out, we could. We were still doing cover gigs every weekend and it stacked up some decent cash. This seemed like a worthy thing to spend it on. The deal was half up front, half before we leave. Sweet! I'd spoken at length with their agent and all was kosher. Blackie, as Matt had named him, would facilitate the deal and get us the best terms possible. As well as paying for the buy-on, we had to pay for ferries, international van hire, fuel costs, merch, food, tolls, and all those other little things that add up. So I had to lean on credit cards again, which I hadn't done since the dark old days. Still, we could figure that out later. We had two months to prepare. Unlike Snot, we didn't have a tour manager, driver, guitar techs, or our own sound tech. We were on our own. Nor could we afford accommodation, so the plan was to sleep in the van. But that was familiar territory. Lugging gear, doing crazy 10-minute pack-downs right after your set, getting a 5-minute sound check, being given a square inch of the merch desk, doing all your own driving and staying the fuck out of the adult's way. We knew the ropes and we were willing to earn our stripes. With our costs cut down to the absolute minimum, we managed to cobble it together in time. And after years of trying, We had ourselves a European tour, baby. Our last gig before we set sail was at Camden Rocks Festival in London. And who did I see as I looked into the crowd but our ex-manager, Sean, with our hapless ex-PR guy and some new band they were undoubtedly rinsing for minibar payments. Still feeling guilty about stiffing us on our campaign, hapless ex-PR guy tried plying me with a random group of girls he'd assembled from somewhere and who didn't seem to mind being pawned off onto a stray musician for less than savoury motives. I politely thanked him and them and declined. We were rapidly shining up that greasy pole, and guys like these were old news. 